before we get started. If you have any questions, there is a question section of the GoToWebinar window. Please post that question in there. I will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, please do not put them in the chat. I do not answer the chat. There's nobody monitoring that as I uh, proceed here today. So talking about system options, uh, I want to start out just asking you folks some questions uh, about things that you're doing, and it will help me a little bit with my presentation here today. Uh, first of all, what release of SOLIDWORKS are you currently using? You should see a poll popping up. If you wouldn't mind just answering the question here, it will help me to understand where most folks are. Sixty-seven percent vote. I was there. We go. All right. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share with you the results here, so you can see. Uh, you know, most of you are on twenty. 2010, 2011, uh, very little adoption of 2012, which kind of surprises me uh, considering uh, SP2 is almost out now. Um, some of the things that we'll be discussing today, I'll, I'll make sure I point out, are in the 2012 release, um, but I want to make you aware of you know the ever-changing uh, landscape of system options. Another question here, how many of you attended uh, part one of the lunch and learn. Give me a second to vote here. Okay, I'm going to close it out and share that with you. Looks like about three quarters of you or so uh, to have not attended. So that will be helpful as I move forward here as well. Uh, and then my last question, since we've been running these webinars, I think we started in 2009, uh, do you folks know that we archive these webinars? And do you know where to go get these webinars if you want to review them at any point? Uh, this is a good resource. I've done webinars on uh, a lot of topics over the last three years. Okay, I think there's enough answer there. It looks like a, a good portion of you do not know uh, that we archive them. So uh, let's let's just show you real quick here. Uh, if I go to caddimensions.com, www.caddimensions.com, 1D in CAD Dimensions, you'll find a tech, or I'm sorry, a resources pull down menu uh, within the main banner bar at the top. In there you'll find videos and web WebEx recordings. It probably should be uh, titled something different at this point. Uh, if you select that, we've broken down uh, our webinars. Here's everything that we did in 2011. There's uh, eight or nine of them here. Uh, and then there's 2010 and then 29. All these are uh, ready to go video content uh, available uh, for you to uh, review. There's some really nice ones out here. If I could point some out, uh, large assembly performance with a PowerPoint that goes along with that. Uh, we've went over the the property tab builder. We've been over setting up templates and custom properties, uh, doing clean installs. Uh, some of the things that we did last year, we went over tables. Uh, design tables, well mint tools. I, you know, you know, this is a resource for you folks to come back in and, uh, you know, take a look at what's out there and uh, and use it to best of your advantage. Okay, so let's move on to what we're going to cover today. First of all, I did want to uh, bring up the upcoming lunch and learn schedule uh, on our web page as well. Under events, schedule events, you can actually sign up for these future lunch and learns and get your notifications. On February 8th, we're going to review multi-body techniques, all the tips and tricks uh, for creating uh, parts in a multi-body environment, doing booleans, add, subtracts, uh, naming bodies and saving them as separate parts, all those little tips and tricks. Uh, we're going to review that. 
On February 22nd, we're going to go through PhotoView 360. We did do it uh, once in uh, 2010, but they've added uh, a good bit of uh, options that came from PhotoWorks uh, now into the 360 product. So we wanted to go over and, and touch that once again. And then uh, by, by request, uh, we've been asked to do a review of drawings and some of the drawing creation options. So March 7th, we're going to go through all the, the commands for creating drawing views inside of drawings and look at all the options for each of those commands as well. So different ways of creating section views, different ways of creating uh, broken out views and where to get to all the options and, and uh, interact with the software with all those different commands. And then on March 21st, we're going to go through all the drawing annotation tools. Uh, things like weld symbols and balloons and go through all the options related to those. Uh, we're going to get as many of those buried in there. Now I can't uh, comment enough on this. If you want to see a particular topic, everything that I pick to cover in these Lunch and Learns comes from somebody requesting, hey, I, I really want to learn more about this. I want to learn more about that. If you have a particular topic that you want to see, send it to me you know try try to pick something that you know has some content not a five minute uh, kind of item but something that we can uh, make into a lunch and learn and I'll be glad to, to turn that around and and as far as I'm concerned it's free training I'm training you how to use some of these particular items now what are we going to cover today uh, there's six uh, tabs that we really didn't touch on uh, in the system options and these six tabs do open up some doors to some other things uh, within the software so I wanted to go through these uh, in the system options we're going to go through the colors tab relation snaps assemblies backup recover search and collaboration and uh, that's gonna uh, get us into a discussion uh, about several of the things so let's go ahead and get started uh, the colors tab in system options uh, there's a little screenshot of it, uh, is where you set the default color for a lot of things that happen within the interface. Let's go ahead and bounce to SOLIDWORKS here for a minute. And if we go to our options, uh, system options under colors, uh, first part I want to point out is the color scheme setting. Some of the things that you don't want to ever touch, uh, you know, I would say... Uh, you know things like dangling dimensions people are so used to those particular colors or overdefined sketch colors you know you can get somebody very confused if you start changing the color of of what it means to be overdefined to black you'll never tell except the interface is going to uh kind of help you with that but there are some things in here that will help you to work within the software now let's start out at the top uh there are some default schemes in here uh, three of them blue highlighting green highlighting and orange uh, the nice thing about these is really not what happens when you have them on in the highlight color it's really when you turn on real view graphics when real view graphics is on the highlighting is uh, is really neat it's kind of uh, glowing I guess you can say and those colors uh, you know those op that option does affect the color that you're seeing there so if I were to come in here and say you know what give me the green highlight and that's gonna highlight in that light color but without the uh, real view graphics on it's just the regular color palette and uh, doesn't really give you anything uh, special there um, I just keep mine really at any any setting in this case now in the middle of the screen it talks a little bit about appearances in scenes appearance is the uh, reflectivity or the material appearance of your components what the default appearance happens to be now that's not set in the system options that's actually set elsewhere um, within your uh, software over at the appearance uh, tab of the task manager so we aren't going to get into that portion of it but this just tells you what your default appearance and default scene happens to be uh, if you wanted to uh, put in 
and make sure there's always a plain background instead of using a scene or you wanted to put your own image file in here uh, as the background you could do that uh, by making these selections now what I really wanted to go through are the options at the bottom because there's four of them here that uh, you just may not be aware that are there first one is uh, use specified colors color for drawing paper color now there used to be an image as part of the sheet background and if I look in here there's a drawing paper color uh, option and I do have the ability to edit that so let's say I wanted to change it to a, a light yellow uh, by default if I select and create a new drawing here you'll notice the drawing is that uh, that gray that image that they're talking about however if I go back into my options and say use this specified color it's going to use what I have in my color scheme as the color so there's my my yellow that I just specified again uh, it's more preference in this particular case but uh, it does make that pop a little bit differently now one that I often get asked you know we look at graphics of other CAD systems and always compare them to SOLIDWORKS uh, use specified color for shaded with edges mode okay if I look in here for the color for shaded with edges selected face find it here okay edges in shaded with edges mode is is typically black okay what you're what you're used to seeing is something like this when the edges are turned on you have a black outline around any fillet edges or boundary edges of the component however uh, if I tell the software uh, to turn that off the default is on if I turn that off it will still do a shaded with edges option but what it does is it shades it with a variation of the color of that component now to me a lot of times this looks a lot softer a lot cleaner uh, and you can still see the edges that you want to see um, so it's something that I wanted to point out so you could possibly uh, use uh, in the future but the shaded with edges and we're gonna go ahead and keep that on as such uh, as we move forward which means turn off this option so it doesn't use the black color and it will use the individual color of the components use specified color when editing parts in an assembly now let's find that assembly edit part I have mine set to blue I think the default is gray currently out of the box um, which which what's that mean to you uh, let me set this to gray so when you go to edit the part inside of assembly you uh, go back here if we want to edit this part or right click on it select edit part okay you can see nothing's uh, currently changed there now if we go back to my options here and go to colors and tell it to use specified colors when editing parts and assemblies that's where these colors will start to uh, tie in now we have edit part color which we're going to change that to the blue and then we have non edit parts which allow us to pick uh, a color for something you're non editing I'm just going to keep blue and you can see now now that I'm working in assembly I can clearly see which component it is I'm editing with the assembly all other components go gray it's a nice way of differentiating between them where I really like the most is when you're doing uh, things like uh, cross-section here and you're look starting to look here you can really distinguish between what you're editing and what you're not and and the edges are a lot crisper when the colors are different okay you don't have to differentiate between all the different colors uh, that you would be working with 
Okay. Now, on the topic of colors, uh, there's one more in here that I want to point out. It's use specified color for changed drawing dimensions on open. Hmm. So I had to figure out a way to, to illustrate this for you. So let's say I have a, a part such as this. There actually exists a drawing on my hard drive of this part. But if I were to change a dimension, we'll just change it very slightly. Okay, which rebuilds the part. And then I decide later on, after I've changed the part or been working in an assembly, that I want to open the drawing for this particular part. Okay, can I tell what dimensions have changed? Do I know what's been affected? I can see now that it says 9784 or 9874. This option, I'm going to not save this for a moment. This next option is what's going to help me highlight any changes. Maybe you got one person working on an assembly in parts, the other person detailing, and you want to see what's changed. If I use specified color for change dimension in drawing, and again, that's uh, in here as well, change dimensions, I'm going to go ahead and set this to maybe like a bright pink here. Now what happens when I do a file open on that particular drawing, it's going to look at what's been changed since the last time the drawing's been saved. Now I think that's useful. I think in a lot of cases it's useful to say, oh, this, is, this dimension's been affected by something else going on. Okay, again, this is a system option, so it'll affect every document that you have open. So you'll have to consider that. Uh, but it is a very nice way of, of seeing those changes. Now, on the topic of color, I wanted to uh, go into uh, a little bit more information as it relates to color here. We're used to being able to select on something, get to our appearances, and, and go to our color wheel. But I want to make the folks online aware of uh, this here. Uh, you typically are going to have three what they call color swatches. Standard, shiny, and dull. And all uh, CAD installations of SOLIDWORKS have those three. However, and I'm willing to provide this if you want to send me an email requesting it, uh, I have the full color wheel. Uh, everything from Crayola's Top 40 uh, down to every standard color and variations thereof. Uh, somebody at one point a few years ago went through uh, a, somewhere called the Color Consortium and created color swatches for everything. Now, where this really helps, if you've got a large assembly and you need to differentiate between colors, for instance, if I go to red, you can see the variations of red that I have uh, before me. I can really get uh, some differences from one to the other. Uh, again, it's just nice to have... Uh, as you're creating these large assemblies in case you want to create something of a, uh, a slightly different color or trying to match the color uh, of something that you uh, have seen. So if you want, want those color swatches, I'll be glad to send those to you. Uh, when you do get them, what you're going to do is go to your file locations under color swatches and wherever this path is you want to place them all uh, in that path and then they will show up as options uh, in the uh, color dialog. Okay so there's uh, colors. Let's talk a little bit about relations and snaps and I don't think these have a super significant effect. Uh, there's one particular scenario I'm going to bring up that always gets me caught up. Um, relations and snaps really came about because of the transition of a lot of users from uh, AutoCAD uh, and the ability to turn on and off snaps uh, within those environments. Um, there is system options that allow you to set what snaps are on by default. 
Okay, and the the system is all filled with snaps of so snapping to center points and quadrant points, and that's just the way we work in SolidWorks. I don't think it's feasible for you to just turn these off and 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 have to add relations manually uh, most of the time. You will want to use these. However, uh, there are times where you may want to turn them off. So, for instance, uh, let's pull one of these up here. Uh, to get to your snaps, first of all, uh, there is a, a quick snaps toolbar. Now, if I right-click in the gray area, I can get to turning on my quick snaps. Let me just bring that to my graphics area so you can see that. You'll notice everything is gray until I physically grab sketch geometry, like a sketch line to actually create something. And then I have my choice over turning on a particular snap. Now that being said, I'm going to just exit out of this for a moment and go to my options. In the system options, there's under sketch, relations and snaps. Here's where I can set the default snaps, which ones are always on. Okay, Do we want to automatically snap? Do we want to create automatic relations to center points, midpoints, quadrant points, intersections? These are really what helps us uh, sketch a lot easier. But here's one scenario where you may want to turn things off. I know most some of you have tried doing this because uh, I do this all the time. What if I just wanted to draw a line from the circle vertical? What happens when I select the circle and I start to draw? It automatically snaps to the quadrant point. Okay? makes it hard for me to, to create a line just going vertical because it's going to, uh, now that that one's there, it's, it doesn't snap to it. But as I draw these lines, they automatically go vertical to the system. Here's where you might want to go in and turn off the quadrant snap so that you're able to draw the line such that it doesn't snap to those quadrant points. Uh, another thing I want to point out as it relates to snaps, if I do have something like the line tool on and I right click in the graphics area, uh, the quick snaps are also located there so you don't necessarily have to turn on the toolbar to do that. So in the case of of my issue with the quadrant snap, what I would do is go to the system options turn off quadrant snapping by default. Okay, so let's do that together. Go to the system options and turn off my quadrant point snap. That way when I'm sketching, okay, my lines are not going to snap quadrant. Oh, and it did. Why did it do it? System relation snap quadrant intersections. Uh, that shouldn't have snapped to the quadrant for me. I'm not sure why it is. Uh, but what what's nice is if you do need that snap, if it's something you've turned off, you could always turn on the quadrant snap and have it automatically uh, snap to the closest. So you, you do have the option if you turn them off by default to kick them on, and you don't necessarily have to use this toolbar uh, to do so. Okay, so moving on, that's relations and snaps. Uh, I want to bring you into the assemblies tab uh, for 2012 because they've added a few things in here, and I apologize since most of you are not on 2012. Uh, you will want some of this functionality when you do get there. Um, this is kind of a conglomeration of options that affect assemblies uh, inside of uh, every assembly document. It really has to do mostly with the number of components in assembly and how it handles the volume of those components and opening opening times and what you're capable of doing. So let's uh, look into SOLIDWORKS here for a moment and go to my assembly tab. Uh, the first one is move components by dragging. We're so used to doing that, I don't know of any reason 
why you would want to turn that off at this point. But let's say uh, you know I've created a copy of a component, and for some reason I didn't want to be able to left select on something to make it move. If I go to my assemblies and turn off move component by dragging, uh, you cannot move that particular component. What you would have to do, and actually move any component in the graphics area, what you would have to do is go to the move component command to be able to move it. So no longer does your left mouse become a, uh, an automatic movement. Or what's nice with that, if you've got a, a mechanism that's very sensitive to the movement and position of components and you keep accidentally picking on a face and it makes it go haywire but you want to keep your mates, uh, that's one uh, option that I may turn on and off uh, from time to time. But I'm going to keep mine on. Uh, prompt before changing mate alignments. I don't really have an example of that, uh, but as you're adding mates, the software can tell you that it needs to flip other mates in order to uh, make a mate position itself properly. All this is is the option that comes up to tell you, hey, I need to fl flip this mate as well because it requires you to say okay uh, to that. One that I think is very big uh, that people may or may not be aware that is there is the option to save new components in external files. <laughs> this really changed the way we work uh, inside of an assembly because now, by default out of the box, when you create a new part, it does not get saved to your hard drive. So I'm in this assembly here. If I want to insert a new part, notice it didn't ask me anything didn't ask me to save it. It's asking me for a plane to place it on. But it didn't ask me to save the file. So I can, you know, model something up here. And uh, it does not require me to do anything. When I exit out, it's, it's set. When I save the assembly, I'm not prompted to do anything with that. But if we look at the feature tree, the part at the very bottom uh, has the parentheses around it is a virtual component. By default, and I believe they did this in 2011 at some point, uh, by default every part that you create is virtual. means it only exists inside the assembly until you save it externally. To save it externally is real simple. You right click on it, save an external file, and then the file gets named and saved to your hard drive. But by default, it is virtual. The option that I'm talking about under assembly says save any new file to external files. In other words, you want it to work the way it used to work. When I insert a new component, it asks me to save it to the hard drive immediately. So I don't have to deal with virtual components. Now, virtual components, in my opinion, are, are phenomenal. If you don't need to have it on the hard drive, keep it virtual. Okay, save new components and external files. Now, the next two options uh, relate more directly to the number of components uh, that you have in an assembly. Uh, really trying to get the most out of uh, your computer and I'm not going to get into a whole spiel about large assembly performance I just want to point out what these two options are going to do you set a threshold that says over this number of components I want to turn on large assembly mode with this number of components I want you to turn on large assembly design review now what these two things are a large assembly mode starts to turn on and off options to make it faster to work within the environment. This thing's been around for 10, 12, um, I, don't know, I can't even remember how many releases. It's been around for a long time. Uh, it opens things lightweight. It hides planes, depending on these options here, to minimize what's been loaded. Now, the next step up, which was added in 2012, is large assembly mode on steroids. It's 
the fastest way to open large assemblies. I have customers tell me all the time that they got their bosses walking through and they need to open up a large assembly as quick as possible to show them something and they're embarrassed by the fact that uh, they have to sit there for two, three minutes to open up, you know, five, six, seven hundred parts uh, live to somebody. So here's the way around that. Now I have my threshold uh, large assemblies uh, to turn on large assembly mode at 200 and I'm going to turn off large assembly design review and I'm going to go ahead and just open a fairly decent assembly now because I don't have the large assembly design review option set on it's going to open it in large assembly mode uh, large assembly mode is going to hide all the planes and axes and sketches it's going to open what components now if this was saved properly all these components would open in lightweight mode. The ones that are loaded are loaded because there's been some changes and it had to load them for changes. So this, this is an older file, so it's loading up the conversion to 2012. Um, if I start expanding the components, especially of the lightweight, you can see that I don't have uh, any features uh, within them. It's just loading the boundary of each component, which makes it real fast uh, to bring up and work with. Now that being said, let's go to our system options and take a look at the large assembly design review. My threshold is set to 800. That particular assembly is uh, like 820 or something. If I go ahead and now open up uh, that using large assembly design review, and for some reason it did not kick it on, I may have to restart SolidWorks for that. I'm going to open up a different way just to show you but let's do this. Now another way to open it up is in the file open dialog. Uh, there's an option for large design review. It seems to me that the system option isn't taking till after a restart. Now I'm already in a large design, assembly design review. You can see how quickly uh, I was able to get in and pan, zoom, and rotate. Things are a lot faster already, so it's almost an instant open uh, for an assembly of of any size. And I know some of you folks online looking at the names do uh, work with some very large assemblies. From here, you have the ability to do things like opening up selective files or resolving files to work with them. So it's not completely useless, uh, but it's a different way of opening it, and it's all driven using your assembly option for a large assembly design review. Okay. Continuing on, I have a few more things here. Uh, the Backup Recover tab, I'm going to real quickly cover this. I think it's been covered a few other uh, webinars, but I want to make sure... Uh, we're clear on, on what we're able to do. The auto recover, backup, and save notification options. Now, if we look in there under backup and recover, there's an option to save auto recover information, and you can specify the number of minutes uh, between the saves. Now, the software's going to save an auto recover file so that if you were to lose power on the laptop or lose power that when you launch it back up again the software is going to look for auto recover files and it's going to present you in a task pane with another tab uh, that represents those files and let me just show you what that tab uh, would look like so you'll end up with a tab called document recovery uh, that's going to help you to open up the file as it existed before you lost power or before something went awry. Now there are situations where uh, you aren't able to recover uh, the document. I also want to be clear that the software is always deleting old backup auto recover information. When you save a file, it deletes the, the auto recover because it doesn't need to recover anything. When you close a file, it deletes the auto recover. So this is not a location you go to to restore data. Now the auto recover folder is actually located, uh, if I look at it here, 
uh, under your users app data it's actually a hidden directory under app data for win7 and you know I have some files in here for an example but the extension is swar and only SolidWorks can really handle uh, the auto recover on those these are auto recover files that it actually was able to recover and I did open you can see it converts them back uh, to an SLD PRT. So that's really what the auto recover does. Now the backup allows you to specify how many backup copies you want, where you want them stored, how many days to keep them, but it's really intended for you to uh, just another option for if you make a change that you did not want. So in this case, uh, I have number of backup copies set to one. Let's take a look at how this this might work. I'm gonna close some of these down. Let's see what we got here. Okay. If we look at uh, my part here. Uh, let's say we open a component. Um, we're going to go ahead and do some change to it. I want to come in here, you know, create a, a cutout. You know, I'm doing my work. And then I decide of that I need to save it. So I go ahead and save it. But then I made a mistake. I realized, oh, that wasn't the right file or that wasn't uh, uh, the right thing to do, or it messed up something in the assembly or, or something to that effect. If I go to the location where the backup is stored, and you can see mine is really the same location as the auto recover except one folder higher, you can see the backup of part two is in there. This is all because of my option settings. This backup should be one save previous to what you've currently done. So even though I've saved the other file, if I double click to open this one, it still should be one save back. So when you open up a file for the first time, it's making a copy of that in the backup directory. So when if you were to make changes in save, that copy is going to be one save back. Okay? Uh, one other option I want to point out as part of this backup recover, there is a little reminder in here, which is kind of nice if you're uh, working along and you haven't saved in a while. You can set it to remind you if it hasn't saved. The default is 20 minutes, so some or most of you may have seen this already, but uh, you can set those numbers uh, to a different setting. Okay, so auto recover and backup. The search tab. Uh, the search tab in the system options uh, it really has two main sections. One that talks about searching and how quickly you can retrieve information. The other one talks about something called dissection. And I'm going to go through both of those. Uh, as part of this. So let's uh, look at this for a moment here. Our search tab. First of all, you'll notice an option at the very top now uh, that was added in the last uh, release or two. You used to have to go to the registry to get this thing turned off. But if you don't want to see the search box at all, uh, you can turn that off. And you'll notice in my graphics area on the right, I no longer have that search box. Okay, if I turn it back on, it comes back. You, again, you used to have to do a registry uh, hit to make that happen. Now, if we're searching on files and models, we need to tell the software how we're going to interact with it. Are we going to go use the web to search 3D Content Central? Okay, so if I'm searching on a gear, do I want it to go to 3D Content Central? to see what gears are in there. Okay. Now, do I want to search while typing? That's the whole new Google thing. Uh, in Google, as you're, you're typing for something, uh, you, 
you know, it starts to search for you and narrow down uh, the websites. So it's going to work very similar to the Google uh, search. Number of results per page, maximum results per data source, um, you know, data source one on your hard drive, two might be 3D Content Central. Now what the software is going to do is it allows you to specify which paths you want to be able to search when you're doing a search command for files and models. Now the software, your computer is actually going to try to index that information to make it even faster to search. In other words, it creates a database of known information and it keeps it up to date. Here's where you tell the software when to perform that indexing. Now let me show you a few things about uh, the search tool here. Now the search tool has been changed uh, considerably over the last few releases. This is 2012, so this won't be an 11 uh, exactly like this. Uh, but there is an option to search on files and models. When you do the files and models option, it's actually using your file location for search paths. And these are the paths that will search uh, to find the files that you type in the search window. So if I type in, uh, you know, my search, which is coupling, it's going to go through and look, in this case, on 3D Content Central and in my search path, but it also breaks it down in 3D Content Central uh, and my local files. Now, this only is searched on because it's in my search path, so it's accessible to me. Now, some of the things that people do not think about was it retains to the search. Uh, let me open that file for a moment, the coupling. And what if I had a file property uh, in the coupling, coupling for description? And I called this uh, coupled adapter. Now, if I wanted to search on that, uh, that's also uh, an option. There's a keyword search, and you can pick the, the custom property in here. And so now I'm looking at uh, a coupling and then description, and now I can type in uh, what it is I want to search on, which is adapter. And that should, uh, again, come up with my, oh, I didn't see here. Search keywords description. Oh, it's got to be capital A. But you can actually search your custom properties in here as well, uh, which is, I think, pretty important uh, to be able to do that. Um, if you have files sitting on a server and you're filling out materials and descriptions and you're not using a PDM system, this allows you to get into that information. Now, I did also want to point out in 2012 the new command search. Uh, the command search is awesome. Uh, if you haven't seen the what's new, um, if I wanted to type in fill it, I start typing into the command search and it will start narrowing down SOLIDWORKS commands the ones that make sense. Now if I find one uh, that I want to initiate, like the fillet command, uh, I have two choices. I can select it to initiate the command, or if I hit the little glasses, it actually highlights and shows you exactly where in the interface the fillet command is. Now even better than that, uh, we introduced a few years back the S key on the keyboard. If I hit the S key on the keyboard, it still brings up my toolbar, but it also also activates the command window off the top right. So if the command isn't on here and I want to perform a D form, it's automatically there. I just hit enter and it takes me right to the command. So you could just about get to any command without ever having to go uh, anywhere but the S key. Hit the S key if it's not on the toolbar, you type it and, and hit enter to, to grab it.
Okay, all of this is uh, made available because you have a system option that provides you the ability to search. Another part of that search is something called dissection. Dissection is what will break down your models into smaller pieces for reuse. And I should have turned this on when I was in there. Uh, I want to schedule a dissection. I want the software to go through and do this for me at a certain time, start and stop time, and that's where I want the information stored. Now, let's say I uh, search for my coupling once again. And uh, let's type that in there. And I found what I'm looking for. If I were to double click on that file, you'll notice that it it takes me into the features that belong to that file. If I double click the feature, it takes me into the sketch. Now, what's nice about that is if I got a new part here and I want to use the exact same sketch uh, as what I used from this part, I just drag it in and it will plop it in there for me. Now, how does dissection work? Well, realistically, if you find a file uh, that you want, let me go to the upper level here. Not sure what else I have in there. Let's see. If I find these are all local files, here we go. So if I find a file like Toolbox here, and I want to reuse some information on this, uh, this snap ring, if you double click on it, it says the file is not dissected. Would you like to dissect it? If you hit yes, the software is going to do the dissection live right in front of you. Now what that means for you is you now have ex access uh, to the individual sketch for that retaining ring that if I wanted to reuse it, I can drag and drop it in. Okay, That's all it really had was an, uh, a sketch associated with it. On top of that, the dissection data actually gets stored in folders where we specify in the options and that's the path that we used and this is a kind of an idea of what it looks like there's the uh, sketch for the uh, uh, retaining ring and here's the individual sketches uh, for my coupling uh, component that I had now back to our system options so we can correlate this this here tells us that we want to actually schedule a time that the software is going to go break those files down for us. Now, I don't like to use this. I think it's easier to go and search on it and double click on it to, uh, when you find it uh, to make it dissect on the fly, just like we're seeing here. Okay, but that's your search and dissection. I recommend you, you take a look at those. And to finish off today, talk real briefly about the collaboration tab. Uh, I have a little quick poll here just to find out where most of you sit here. If you wouldn't mind, how many of you are currently using a PDM system? Okay, it looks like uh, I'll share the numbers with you. About a third of you are using a PDM system. Now these collaboration options uh, are going to help you when it comes to collaborating without a PDM system. So what we're going to do in SOLIDWORKS, let's first of all uh, close some of these uh, documents down that I have open. All right. Now, if I go in there and I turn on collaboration, uh, enabling a multi-user environment, in other words, we're dealing with more than one user working on the same assembly or drawing. Uh, there's an option here to add shortcut menu items for a multi-user environment and to check if the files are open read-only have been modified by other users. So let's go back to our little air source uh, assembly that we have here. 
I'm logged in as user one, and I've now specified that I'm going to use this multi-user environment. Now, you can see just by opening SolidWorks that the assembly is open with full write access because it would say read only up here uh, if I didn't. Now, with the multi-user environment on, I now have in my pull-down menu under File an option to make components read only or make the assembly read only. Okay. I can do this at the entire assembly level, which makes it read only, or now I can do it also for each individual component, uh, making them read read only. And I got to do it one at a time here. Make read only, make read only. So if you're going to have somebody else uh, work on a particular component, for instance, this plug that I have here, you may want to make it read only. Now the opposite of that is get write access. So the collaboration options also give you the right click to get right access when somebody else has that access. Okay. Now I'm going to try to simulate this uh, in front of you here. So let's uh, do this. So we're going to go to SolidWorks. And I'm going to go find the executable for SolidWorks. Somewhere in here. Let's sort by type. Apologize, it's a little bit hard to find in all the files that we have in here. There they are. Now, I'm going to run this as another user. I'm going to do a run as administrator. And I'm going to try to open up the same air source assembly. Okay. Now, if I go to File Reload, I can actually see... Uh, in my reload dialog, which users have right access to particular components. Okay, so I can see which ones I cannot work on uh, because somebody else. But you can see the QD plug uh, has access to that QD plug. So if I want to, um, I can uh, actually work on this particular file because I have right access to it. So let's just change a dimension on it. Okay, and I'm doing and we'll even open it up and save it. Now what happens now is now that I'm in the other assembly as part of our options here under collaboration, it says check if the files open read only have been modified by other users. Check every one minute is an option. What will happen is down to the bottom right hand corner you'll see a pop up that says files have been modified by other users. There is another way of doing that however is if I go to customize my interface and go to my standard command toolbar, there's a command in there called check read only files. We'll put that on my standard toolbar for a moment. If I say check read only files, it it checks them and it says user with write access. Is there a newer version on disk? So in other words, has somebody saved a newer version already to the hard drive? Okay, I then can just say I want to reload, say okay, and it will bring me the latest version of that plug, which is the 054 value. Now, by no means uh, am I saying collaboration can even hold a candle to document management. If you need a temporary solution to working together and swapping read versus write access and uh, making sure things get loaded in properly, I think uh, there is something to be gained from that. So um, with that said, uh, that's what we're going to close with. I don't see any current questions. 
Uh, I look forward to emails for the color swatches, emails giving me uh, suggestions on future topics, and I look forward to you folks uh, attending the next Lunch and Learn. Thank you.